this is the final um, talk of three, and um, I show some different titles for each uh, to give some theme, perhaps, uh, or some um, um, framework for for uh, going into connecting different um, things to talk about. And uh, today. I chose the title uh, "Evokes Many Levels of Meaning and Combinations of Focus," which is part of the uh, beginning of the of complexity and contradiction in architecture by Venturi. And I think what we will be talking about today is uh, a little bit different than the first two. Uh, the format is the same. Um, I'm gonna um, share my screen soon and, and go into images of buildings I posted on my. Instagram. Uh, it's uh, it's buildings I've visited in the last two years, and images I've taken with the phone. Um, so in the first two talks, we talked. Uh, the first one was a bit about getting very close to buildings and seeing details and and um, realizing some um, uh, almost choices that the architects are making and and the sort of joy of of those details. And the second one was a bit more about some overarching quality that some buildings have almost like a character um, that you can relate to um, strongly and um, today it's going to be a bit more about something uh, I think uh, the talk today is going to be a bit more searching and um, open uh, which also relates to the the, the topic um, which is that um, the uh, um, I think uh, a key word here is tension, uh, something that will, I think, come true in many of the projects. Um, it's about uh, working with and sort of restraining yourself from um, um, going too far in, in, in uh, making something sort of strong and perfect and complete, and instead sort of stopping a bit earlier and, and then combining things. Um, so you will see some very confident buildings, but they do share um, an interest in, let's say, composition or, or relations or attention that I think you will see in in, in the in the images. So I will um, I will share my screen um, and get started. Um, so. I think we see my screen now. So I think a little bit like the last time, I, what I will actually do is that I will start with a bit of a prologue or a detour of a sense uh, that actually isn't, or actually is, let's say, the, the partner, the background uh, to a lot of the things that I think we'll see in the other buildings. And so the first building is, is, is from Stockholm. It is a um, quite remarkable building. It's a uh, kind of a... Um, corner location, a bit like the famous uh, grid iron in, uh, in New York. So, and, and this is a building by Erik Lallerstedt. Uh, it was built for an insurance company on a prime spot. Um, but the thing here is that I, I think this building very much encapsulates this tendency in the, what we call the national romanticism, um, which is about the same time as the Jugendstil and the Arnavo. Uh, when they had this amazing quality, uh, this sculptural um, plastic uh, ability to compose buildings that have a uh, immense power and um, sort of sculptural perfection, and this um, you can see it in this um, this uh, aspect from 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 all parts, everything goes together. It, it's almost a bit like um, uh, it's a little bit like. Um, a hammer almost or something like that some some very uh, powerful and and um, and there are a lot of details of course in these kinds of buildings but but everything sort of goes towards um, almost merging with uh, the different parts are sort of merging and and uh, coming together so there are um, the main thing here is really the 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 uh, the overall composition and to for something with a very different uh, feel but uh, some of the same logic we will go to the first building was from around 1910 perhaps I didn't say that and another uh, excellent building in Stockholm uh, by Ferdinand Boberg uh, it's a slightly earlier 1903 um, 
and this is I mean this is just a remarkable building and um, Bober is, is, is such a master of this um, almost uh, kind of very soft soft um, uh, soft and powerful uh, stone um, so moldings almost or something like that it, it's very sculptural it's very plastic but you, see, you can see here that everything sort of melts together this um, intricate portal everything is is sort of uh, sucked into the the wall in a sense and um, and this uh, kind of and of course uh, just for uh, <laughs> fun these are the there are such brilliant ornaments on this uh, building it's it's almost impossible to to capture but but everything goes together in this sort of almost um, there is an overall uh, quality of, of the building that is um, sort of taking in all the different parts into some some unified uh, effect and um, we can also compare this um, we can see I showed earlier um, in one of the previous talks uh, this corner of uh, a building by Carl Bayer Stenin Lund is also from around that time, 1910. Um, if we look at the overall form here, it's it's less confident and and sculpturally you know put together than the previous examples. But there is something still about um, everything is sort of merged and um, you know sculpted from a kind of block. Um, if we then um, go to a building that is from around this time, and we will see a lot of buildings from the 1920s, uh, uh, which is an interesting time. So a little bit, the way that we will go into this uh, theme, I think, is that we had that background of, of, of the buildings that were very unified and very sort of sculptural and very strong and very, you know, it's, it, it's a very difficult thing to make a building that's a very strong, uh, has a very strong plastic uh, sculptural quality. And so when we come to this building, which is a kind of a very rather unknown building, I'd say it's a parish house by Hakon Alberg. It's from 1920-25, just on the outside of Stockholm. Um, this is one of the, the main facades. It's on a hill. Um, it has this portal that really sort of you can see in the in the in the wall um, treatment or in the massing of the house that is still this kind of unified um, mm, aspect but but here in the um, in these elements something is sort of starting to 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 detach a little bit this is the fantastic rear facade um, I will just go through some of these buildings um, I mean the details here are, are excellent uh, exquisite here you see a little bit more about the form of the building and I think it was uh, perhaps it's on this one. You will see some elements that are really still kind of this sort of um, almost national romantic, uh, you know, dark massing, uh, strong round forms. And then we see here uh, some emerging kind of um, pulling apart or, or um, composition between this sort of very um, um, kind of smooth and soft uh, recessed parts with these sculptural staircases. Um, um, I mean, there is a lot of fun in, in the overall shapes here, but um, uh, here perhaps is a good example of this um, impressive, um, inventive quality of this, um, uh, the background of, of this generation. This is from below. Uh, but really here on the on the rear side of this building, you will see there is something about this uh, kind of informal um, facade that's uh, with the staircases and the windows here. That um, this is an interesting element as well. This kind of a screen-like um, double column, um, small balustrade thing, almost like a sort of added fragment. Um, so, in some sense, I think um, the thing we are we're seeing here a little. This is a kind of an in-between building, in a sense. Perhaps it has a lot of the, you know, skills and sensibilities of the previous buildings, 
it's also starting to to um, to loosen up that a little bit. And I think we will um, I will go to um, a more uh, a building that's it's not it's a one kind of building that we have a lot in Stockholm. It's a kind of residential building from the 1920s, um, a kind of um, way to to I mean they built a lot of housing in Stockholm in the 1920s. And a lot of buildings were, um, it became a kind of a style. But you can see on this building, it's uh, uh, the facades on this building, uh, this kind of an unusual greenish uh, color for Stockholm. But all the parts of this facade is, are really, um, it's kind of a, a very flat, flat facade. And the different floors and different elements are really sort of kept apart and, and, and hanging on the outside. And those ornaments that are very well, um, you know, worked out. They um, they never um, they never never seem to sort of flow from the building on different floors. Uh, different things are happening. Um, there is a um, particular quality um, ar um, ar arising from the, the this sort of combination between the. Um, um, the different parts. Uh, I think um, there is a, a general quality of the building that's very, very flat in a sense uh, and, and shallow. And you can see this if you look, start looking at the individual ornaments, like um, just above the door. Um, this kind of very inventive. It's instantly recognizable as some sort of classical element, but you can't really say. It's not a quote in a sense. It's more of a, a very skilled um, interpretation or uh, or game, perhaps played with our uh, expectations. And the simplest elements um, achieve a, a rather remarkable effect on these facades. This is really, really very shallow um, reliefs. And um, and then um, going from that. Um, I was thinking about another um, residential building. I have to apologize a little bit. I'm going to have to scroll up and down a lot here because they are sort of uh, very differently um, um, interspersed here on the on the Instagram feed. Um, so um, so this is another residential building in Stockholm, um, which is from 1923. Um, this is also not a uh, well-known building. Uh, it's also an interesting kind of, has relations to the older um, brickwork of these dark national romantic uh, buildings. Uh, it has this sort of classical elements attached or detached from, from the building. Um, so here we see a bit of the both uh, the sort of sensibilities coming through. Um, I mean, the overall building is kind of formed in a sculptural way. It uses its corner in a in a rather sculptural fashion, cutting off of the corner like this. Um, but if we start to look at the um, the details on the, especially at the lower uh, level of this building, the very peculiar, uh, almost um, I don't know even what to call this. Very strange. Uh, all the columns they lack. Like, um, uh, and tosses, and they, they have a, a very peculiar um, some kind of capital and pagoda-like uh, cornices. Uh, you see some of these um, going into more detail. Uh, there is, um, you can almost compare it in this image like this, um, the lower part is, everything is sort of pulled apart and can be visible in, a, in its, uh, particular uh, elemental quality and on the upper part here you can see still how the bricks are forming this um, you can still feel like the heaviness of the of the brick wall in a sense in the surrounds of the windows um, and um, um, I think we'll see a, f a few more of this effect here it was a great time for invention this uh, the 1920s in Stockholm all these sort of classical elements that we see here are almost always sort of, I don't know if you would say non-canonical or 
uh, I mean, they are. It's always um, a rather elegant play and between recognition and, uh, and free invention. And I think that invention is is part of that legacy from the uh, earlier generation. But um, the distance from that generation is uh, in that restraint from from uh, from from achieving that uh, perfect sort of overall a coherent uh, form on that effect and um, I think what we will do is that we will jump a little bit here from from Stockholm uh, in the 1920s uh, and see some comparisons to to Milan um, and um, I mean there are a lot of these themes that are um, visible in a lot of the architecture from the 1920s also in, in um, in Italy and, and in Milan, perhaps particularly, um, and I think what we we can uh, we can look at the uh, famous um, uh, the famous and this is of course one of the great uh, you know urban uh, sculptures in a sense. Uh, I mean, this has the the full plastic brilliance and, and power of that uh, the first building I showed, of course, but but achieved in this very sort of cold and uh, precise and kind of shallow um, surface treatment that really brings such uh, immense attention to the, the facade and the combination to that overall shape. Um, uh, this building is, uh, I mean, it has a complex sort of uh, perimeter, um, there are some elements that are uh, supremely sculptural and sort of freestanding, and there is a, there is an element of that um, you will see in some other aspect of this uh, Milanese uh, buildings that are a great contrast to the ones in Stockholm, where uh, the, the classical elements being used have a greater, um, you know, a kind of. Um, if, if you want to make a, a, a comparison, it's very often the case that in, in, in Stockholm, for instance, or in, in the 1920s classicism, you have a more sort of flat and, and, and uh, very uh, shallow relief. And in the Milan's examples, you, you see many times a kind of more um, full-bodied um, elemental quality in the, in the sculptural fragments. But this is, of course, a very, I mean, this is a refined uh, facade and there are so many um, relation between the different parts here that are, that are being made. But uh, I think we will compare this, um, um, and you will see here, of course, the, it's a great game of, of this sort of extreme um, precise reliefs and those uh, amazing columns. Um, it's a, of course a remarkable thing, and I can't help but to think that, of course, here you have a kind of a, um, a richness of material as well. I mean, if you go around Milan, you have such a, a range of stones and uh, material uh, richness, or richness in the materials themselves. So that's, of course, a, a part of the repertoire here. Um, I think if we look at the a building from around this time uh, by um, Gio Ponte and uh, Emilio Lancia uh, from 1928. Mm, um, the Cabrutta is from around 1920, a little later. Um, this is a building that kind of reminds you, uh, or re reminds me of um, uh, some of these buildings we have in Stockholm, but there is a, uh, sorry about that, uh, there is a, um, a slightly more, um, I don't know, kind of, uh, I mean, rich in the almost literal sense that these uh, ornaments, the uh, how, how many ornaments, the, the use of them, the, there is a greater, um, this is from the courtyard, uh, there are on so many levels, these slightly manneristic uh, uh, elements come together in a dramatic way. Um, even so, they are interestingly abstracted and 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 related. So they never um, they don't give the appearance of being uh, 
um, they don't give the appearance of being uh, this. Uh, I guess uh, another kind of background to this is, is the kind of bosar, um, almost systematic uh, solution of, of things where you would have the uh, perfect. Um, you know, solutions for everything available. And here you can feel like there is a strangeness to the overall composition of these elements coming together, uh, which I think um, uh, is the result of a very refined process. I mean, there are, uh, it's interesting, then you see this very tiny little, um, it's such a contrast, I think, between this uh, slight uh, passageway or uh, entrance for cars, perhaps, or something like that, which has the, almost a, uh, very ancient uh, feeling, completely different from that other uh, great game on the facades. Um, also, in, in the interior, it's an immensely rich uh, environment. I mean, the it's almost uh, inconceivable to <laughs> that someone would make a you know a kind of an apartment building with this. Um, I mean, with these features, it's such an perfectly balanced overall, every part of it uh, comes together in such a perfect way. I mean, on the interior here, uh, this great stairwell um, and the individual elements. And uh, if we go back to the quote on many levels of meanings and combinations of focus, I mean, there is a, there is a confident, certainty or, or capability of knowing exactly what kind of a ornament to use uh, on all the different levels. Um, it's also a striking, strikingly inventive uh, overall quality. It's not at all something you would sort of recognize or uh, it's sort of without references, but it's the individual part have, have great, um, you know, historical and uh, evocative um, uh, re resonance. Um, I mean, these um, interiors are, it's almost um, a bit, little bit difficult to relate to the, the richness of this. Uh, I mean, this is a kind of a, a playful and uh, um, I don't know, it's not a rational mind, but it's a, a very, you know, a confident hand putting all this, these things together. But it's such a um, layered richness, I, I guess, is, is, is something that, that you, wouldn't, you would almost expect it to be much um, uh, older. So it's a, a kind of a, a game being played there, I think, as well. Uh, some other interesting buildings from this time, I think, um, which are very close to the famous uh, <clears throat> to the famous Villa Necchi by Portaluppi. Uh, very close to this one, there are three buildings by Aldo Andreani. That's our uh, just in the neighbors neighborhood um, or neighboring buildings. Um, this is a fascinating building. It's very difficult to photograph, and the the light was kind of difficult this day, but. Um, you will see here, this is from uh, 1924 to 1927. Um, I think you will see here a, a kind of quality in the, the way the classical details are used here. They are more, I mean, they are more um, expressive, they are more full, um, they have a greater plastic, uh, depth and intensity and power, but it's still something about the overall composition, the, the play of contrast of smooth and, 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 and rough and uh, the, the pulling apart or the sort of hanging quality of different uh, parts of the elements that are um, just um, wonderfully, um, you know, brilliant. So instead of having a kind of a, uh, I mean, you do have a sort of, you have a recognition at the, at the same time you have a, a bit of a distance, always being uh, kind of nicely calibrated. But I mean, this is such a, this is a, a much more 
brilliant and and and, and um, this is a little bit like uh, they're using more of the, the the possible register to to um, on the different facades. All, all, all these are some elements that are also a little bit sort of flowing from the wall, but also uh, kind of distinct and, uh, and and free free hanging in a sense. Um, there is also this. Um, um, it's called a villa, but it's kind of an apartment block. Uh, very close to it, you will see some uh, some details here that are almost um, added or free hanging. And I don't know. There is some. Uh, you can see. You can feel that there is a kind of uh, interest in uh, relating to these elements and manipulating them and, and combining them in extreme exceptionally free and inventive com compositions. Of course, you know, classicism is a kind of a, a very uh, um, nimble style in a sense, or, or nimble language that is has been used and, and um, been sort of uh, developed or, or um, adapted to, to many new functions uh, over time. So there are, I mean, there are many uh, ways it has it has had this um, evolution. That's almost part of the the syntax. Um, but I think what what combines the the first examples with with this one is a little bit. If you compare it to the Swedish ones, it there is something a little bit more. Um, th these are going a little bit more towards a, a kind of a. Uh, perhaps it's more mannerist, but it's uh, a kind of unif unified character um, still, and and perhaps it's something about the uh, the depth of the you know knowledge of the classical language in in Italy as relates to the uh, by necessity peripheral uh, distanced view of the uh, Nordic classicists, but um, but there is some kind of relation there, and I think. Um, so as not to jump too much between the cities, I will I will relate these uh, sort of detached uh, elements, uh, kinds of buildings, with uh, some uh, buildings from that relate to this, uh, or, or from a generation after, you might say, from the 1950s, um, where you can see a similar relation, I think, to the Swedish example, but perhaps uh, the times uh, the time is a little different. So, what we see here in the some a, a few buildings by Luigi Cacciadominioni from the 1950s, you will see uh, a kind of a, a quality that we recognize from this um, Milanese uh, 1950s uh, uh, buildings. Um, these are, you know, kind of uh, buildings that are not sculpturally, uh, you know, they're not formed to be uh, prismatic blocks or or um, powerful structures in that sense. They have a kind of assembled quality, but every detail is very very precise, and you will recognize a lot of sort of classical uh, elements here uh, transposed but at the same time i think i mean these sort of shallow uh, walls and this extremely flat uh, stone uh, stone base uh, a very interesting detail are these sort of half rusticated corner where it goes around which relates to both to the um, the balcony situation and also the, the this um, um, the circle of the building, uh, but there is a. This is a little bit like, in relation to the very muscular and powerful plastic qualities of the classical aspects of the 1920s Milanese architecture. We can see here a kind of abstraction, perhaps, while at the same time. Um, there are these sort of compositional uh, elements that I think uh, 
relates quite strongly. Another building by Caccia Dominione from uh, the late 50s um, is a kind of a more complex urban setting. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, building um, on a tight road next to a church and then facing a kind of a corridor like backside. Um, also here we see this great, uh, this is almost talking back to the first talk uh, about the sort of almost individual stones. You can feel like a connection here with uh, those um, uh, Caesar um, flat stone composition in the uh, Serralis Museum, for instance. Uh, but there is also some, um, uh, you know, alignment to the urban structure, the structure of the block, the order of the facade, um, at the same time resisting the perhaps uh, too um, figurative uh, use of, of ornaments. Uh, you will see here some of the stone details. This is on the rare side. Uh, on the other side from that street. Um, also here we see this small stone, uh, you know, supremely confident uh, handling of these uh, elements, how they're being put together, how the two halves of that building relate to each other, uh, which is also something about making a building that is containing a lot of sort of almost fragments within an overall scheme and holding them together while at the same time uh, letting some unresolved tension remain so that uh, the building sort of vibrate with this kind of um, uh, energy. I mean, they are very beautiful buildings. Uh, there are so many details and um, situations that you can uh, that you can focus on. Um, on the last uh, building by uh, Caccia Dominione um, that I will show here is a, a, a very nice and kind of. Um, more perhaps explicitly open and building. It's in Corso Europa next to the um, Galleria um, Strasburgo. And um, the, um, in some ways, I think if you look at it briefly, there are not that many elements that you perhaps uh, think stand out from, from, from this time. But when you start to look at, at them and this small refined sort of stepping out, these moldings on different levels, um, these kinds of, you can see here over the windows, this, um, I think, metal, uh, um, very precise, uh, small corners there and these elements. It's a interesting, um, effect. Uh, you will see it even more on that behind that kind of a strange arcade or screen towards the street. You can see this um, condensed and almost convoluted um, situation where these different shapes they come together. It's almost impossible to uh, detect uh, uh, some sort of uh, obvious um, order to the building. But you will see all these uh, amazing elements coming together. I mean, there are these details here that are um, re reminiscent of some uh, similar effects being used by Peter Merkley, for instance, uh, nowadays. But otherwise, this is a kind of, uh, I think there is a, a kind of richness here that is um, it's a little bit like uh, you're almost, uh, um, it's almost like you're not, you can easily miss a, a building like this. This is the great complexity in a building like this, sort of just passing it by and sort of 
writing it off as something, let's say, from that time. But I, I do think there is a exceptional um, you know strangeness and richness in this in this building. Uh, we sit a little bit here on the on the on the lower part uh, to the street as well. Um, so um, I think uh, uh, these examples um, they they illustrate in a slightly different way this uh, uh, relation between you know going along with the kind of uh, sculptural and plastic uh, capability that you have perhaps as an architect or almost sculpture in a sense. Uh, and then another one that is very conscious of that potential, but is sort of resisting the, uh, to, to let it go, uh, so to say, um, all the way. Um, I thought before I go back to, to uh, uh, Sweden, I think I will just make a quick um, stop in, uh, in London, and uh, this is a, around the same time. Um, I don't have that many examples here from from uh, from London that could back it up on that on that uh, with as many examples. But if we just take one here, uh, a building by um, Lachens, uh, it's a bank. Um, the dates, as I understood them, were from the from 1924 to 39. But the, this is a interesting um, contrast to the other ones. This is a more unified classical language um, of this building. I mean, it it has it, it sits very well in the sort of urban setting. Um, there are these. Uh, um, you know, if you, I think everywhere you look on this building, uh, you will find that there are um, a lot of inventions and you know plastic and sculptural qualities that are sort of almost hidden inside this. Um, there's an overall uh, harmony to the the overall shape that that you ha almost have to to start look at the the more particular. Uh, elements here uh, to start seeing the um, how it all has sort of been put together. And one of the one of the the greatest games in in this building is that um, on the lower level you ha you have this kind of uh, uh, arched uh, uh, pedestal in a sense or, or circle and. Um, if you if you go a little closer and you start to look at these um, uh, these elements, uh, there are these um, there is a great game being played of these sort of hidden pilasters um, everywhere on this building. Uh, you can see perhaps best here. You see this uh, recessed um, entrance and then on the side, so the continuation here in the pilaster, but it sort of the shaft sort of disappears here uh, and. Um, and is uh, achieved in, inside the, or melded into the kind of rustication in a sense. And this is an interesting effect because here you see like the lower part of that, uh, here is uh, the upper part and then it sort of get lost in a wall and then you find it at the lower part. These are almost like stumps or fragments that are just hanging there or standing there and you have the other ones sort of hanging there. And this is an interesting um, example I think of, uh, you, you find them here again. Uh, these are great. Uh, well, this is sort of a promise of something that 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 is all done consciously, sort of um, kept away a little bit. Uh, and uh, I think this is an interesting. I mean, this is a little bit like. If you compare that to the uh, Ferdinand Bouberry post office, where everything is sort of melt, melding into the uh, the sort of soft shapes of, of the building, this is a other kind of. I don't know if it is a camouflage or misdirection in the use of this uh, rustication joints, but uh, it's such a 
it's such a witty and, and rich uh, play with these uh, elements. So when you start to look at them, it's uh, well you can find it sort of everywhere. And and then at the same time, uh, as we saw in the first image, um, it's such a underplayed uh, character in the uh, in the uh, in the overall composition. So I do find that there is a uh, a similarity there, perhaps, of, of knowing uh, that some effects are perhaps best uh, achieved by holding back a little bit of, on, on how to sort of express them or how to, to fine tune them. And then I think we will, uh, we will go back to Sweden and, uh, and uh, we will touch on a building that we were, uh, Talked about, I think, in the first first talk, which is, of course, one of the most famous buildings uh, nowadays, uh, the Resurrection Chapel by Leverance. So, just touching on that very quickly, we, I think we can see a little bit that there is something about this building um, in in its overall um, perfection, perhaps, or or some brilliant handling of, of all the different parts here that are um, it's possible to read all the different or a lot of different um, elements sort of almost freestanding but this is this is such a sort of consciously perfect I mean while you know manneristically uh, drawn out and so on but but being put together th th this is a building that in one sense sort of goes towards that uh, unified aspect of, uh, of those sort of previous buildings while at the same time um, you know very brilliantly changing our perception of it with, with some uh, uh, you know manneristic kind of uh, devices and so on and so this is from um, 1921 to 25 um, and if we go with Leverance to the uh, down to Malmö, to the eastern cemetery in Malmö, which is um, you know it's 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 that cemetery that is perhaps uh, well known for many through this um, incredible late work of Leverance, the, the famous flower kiosk. But in reality, Leverance worked on this cemetery for a, a very long time. Uh, I don't know, 40, 40 50 years. Um, and one of the earlier ones uh, that he built, uh, earlier parts, is not that different in time from, from the Resurrection Chapel. It's from 1923 to 26. This um, funerary chapel sort of uh, pushed into the, the ridge or a kind of a long hill running along an axis. And um, this is a very powerful building. And I think there is something about th this building uh, that has um, um, so I think the general dynamic of what I'm sort of uh, talking a little bit about today doesn't necessarily fit neatly into you know this decade against that decade and so it can be within the work of one architect be within the work of a of, of a um, of a city or um, you know different um, perhaps um, any kind of, uh, I mean, I, I don't know the division between a commercial uh, apartment building or a sort of a ritualistic or, or a religious uh, edifice. Perhaps also meant there were some different sensibilities there. But this building is, um, I mean, this building isn't really um, doesn't use those devices of. Of 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 uh, dislocation and and um, you know pulling things together. This very much goes into a kind of very very peculiar and, and a bit strange, uh, but a very powerful unified composition. Um, just next to it is a more of a a, a tiny little thing. You might say this, of course, rem reminds a little bit about that funerary chapel by uh, or grave that we saw by Asplen. Um, in the previous talk, uh, this is just a waiting room 
uh, by levels from the early 1920s. But then something interesting happens here uh, in the uh, mid 30s, early 40s, where uh, the the development of this graveyard is a uh, um, a very long and 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 complicated history, but at some point um, the central uh, figure of the era becomes to a, a kind of peculiar uh, composition of two twin chapels um, that are almost uh, totally similar, but standing ne next to each other, St. Knut and St. Gertrude. Um, and here are, they have these remarkable colonnades. Um, the colonnades were actually sort of dismantled and re, um, reconstructed very, very thoroughly by Johan Selsing a few years ago. Um, so they are in a, in a perfect, kind of perfect condition. But if you look at, if you look at something like this in, in thinking of the, you know, um, the kind of uh, going back and forth between the sort of unified uh, qualities of, of some buildings and the buildings that, that sort of consciously uh, maintain a kind of attention between different parts. I, I think here Leverance has gone from his, you know, brilliant um, phase of, of, of handling that classical language, such as in the Resurrection Chapel and the uh, Begitta Funerary Chapel, uh, to such uh, powerful effect. Uh, and here it's it's very much a kind of um, a very different search for relation between different parts. So um, towards the, um, the side that you enter, which is on the, the sort of main axis going through the cemetery, you have this uh, very peculiar uh, colonnades. I mean, they do have a sort of rich evocative uh, reading as, as some kind of, you know, colonnade arcade. Um, there is something um, difficult to say, pre-classical pre, pre perhaps almost in them. If you go on the inside, uh, a lot of the, um, the spaces and the rooms are, on the other hand, kind of, well, I guess they go a bit more towards that unified uh, character in a sense. You have this, the brickwork. Um, you have this sort of great space. It's a very um, non kind of hierarchical way. There is a, a little bit like in the Resurrection Chapel, the, the organ um, stand is, is kind of hidden away. So it's uh, very much uh, just a, a volume. There are some particular elements here, and you can see here in this great uh, window with this peculiar stone edge uh, going around, where you can still perhaps even here dropping down a little bit. There are these uh, figural, um, you can perhaps see here the individual uh, bricks uh, sort of flowing into that stone. Uh, surround that figure. Um, so I think here you feel, you can feel like Leverance has been, um, in a sense Leverance sort of started out knowing these um, great powerful sculpt sculptural buildings. Uh, and then at the same time, he also went through this um, experience of that, uh, great phase of the 20s classicism where everything was sort of, you know, almost pulled apart and put together so you can you can know the individual elements as well. And, and here he really sort of um, manages to go into some some kind of synthesis or, or, or unified aspect. Uh, there are a lot of individual elements, this uh, famous uh, railings, um that are you know you can sort of pick them apart um it's an infant kind of richness in in individual details but i think um yes i think there is a great uh, search for um a kind of um 
lack of uh, you know obvious reading both on the overall scale and on the individual parts and I think that is uh, so I think these are very mature works by, by Leverens uh, and very similar works I mean I don't have any images now from from his later churches um, but I do think there are themes uh, in those churches that that, that tie into these um, the things we see here and which sort of go back to that old um, uh, so then I will quickly um, just um, say a few words about two more buildings and then I think we will open up for some discussions. Um, one interesting building uh, a little later from uh, the early 70s by Håkon Alberg, which was one of the first uh, architects we saw then, uh, who was sort of uh, making that parish house a little bit on the edge between the National Romanticism and kind of emergent uh, classicist aspect um, this um, interesting kind of uh, pristine uh, forms of these uh, prismatic volumes coming together and then on the inside there is a exceptionally rich um, uh, and kind of mysterious room that isn't at all like uh, a lot of these dark Greek churches that we are accustomed to seeing from this time um, I think this is a um, very much uh, kind of a, uh, you know resistance to to going too far uh, in either direction in a sense. so there there are these elements that um, that you know obviously connect back to the sort of rosary windows uh, the, the, the columns nades and, and the sort of almost gothic uh, uh, side things here um, and the materials are kind of kind of soft, uh, and you have the vaults, um, and the lighting is is rather peculiar. So I think on, on in relation to um, a lot of the buildings that were going on at this time, I think this building is is also one that could go into this category because it uses a lot of the elements that we see from this kind of roofless buildings from this time. Um, but it it retains some uh, some elegance or some some uh, restraint there. And then the very last building, I'm, I think I'm running a little bit over time. But I think the very last uh, building I wanted to to end on is um, I don't think it's very well known. And this is one of the most fun and um, excellent and complex buildings I think we have in Sweden that is probably almost completely unknown. Um, this is also a church um, on the outside of Stockholm. It's called the Vårby Ward Church by Harald Tafelin from uh, late 60s, uh, mid 70s. Uh, that's a process. And um, this, um, it's it's a, the, the first image we are seeing of this building is a kind of a, has a kind of de deconstructed um, feeling of this sort of, sort of hanging. Um, water um, collectors uh, around this sort of side chapel on the inside you will realize when you enter the church but there is uh, I think it's almost even there are even more uh, strange things this is the overall shape of the church this great overhanging um, peculiar roof uh, these sort of white walls and then you have these slanted uh, roofs uh, over some um, built out forms or side chapels um, we will see on the back side and there is this sort of great um, rusticated base um, so on the on the back side which is towards a uh, kind of a, a slight mountain or, or slope uh, there is this this is like the great uh, or this is the sort of entrance situation so there's an interesting composition here of of uh, some strange uh, doubleness or, or mimesis of, of some kind. Um, this uh, portal that you enter through has a strange um, earthy kind of quality. But the main part of the building is really this kind of white uh, brick that's very, very precise in relation to these joints and um, all the different parts. Uh, and this is a kind of, um, I think there is something about on on the exterior of this building. There are these uh, uh, 
um, the way that the elements are both you know forming a kind of um, overall wall and then stopping at some points going to the corner going to a joint or not going to the joint um, that is very consciously play, playing with this sort of is it a unified uh, volume or is it in or is it something that sort of knit together or, or something like that so i think there is um interesting uh, game going on there and then when we come to the um, interior of this building this is really one of the well first of all um the building has two parts the white white volume is the church and then there is this um red brick uh, parish house that, that is connected and um there is a it's kind of a clash between the volumes when they're coming together um but if you go to the interior it's um it's even more that the the space of the church is um it's very difficult to to capture in uh, in, in images perhaps but there is such a you know Tavelin, he had a, a kind of a theory that he was he was against uh, the central perspective as a device he wanted to uh, compose uh, in different ways so uh, this is a kind of a uh, consciously composed um, complex interior with many uh, I guess uh, ties back perhaps then to the theme of, of, of um, many combinations of focus and, and many levels of meaning um, I feel like perhaps uh, I will not have time to go into all the particular details of this building because it's almost too many it's like almost like every element here uh, this uh, amazing columns with the capitals that also have this extra you know steel steel capital above um, um, the liturgical um, uh, pieces of furniture uh, that are sort of placed inside the um, inside this uh, uh, rich uh, interior this is the lectern or the what we call the where where the the sermon is given which is usually raised but here is sort of standing on the on the floor very low uh, and then when you come into the parish house uh, the, it's such a it's very strong colors this is one of the most uh, amazing rooms it has a, a kind of a, a game with with colors uh, this is one of the uh, it's a room sort of cut on the diagonal with this sort of red uh, blue parts uh, put together um, in linoleum floors and so on so uh, this is a kind of um, there are almost all elements in this building I think is, is also very conscious uh, and confident handling of he knows uh, in my reading that um, he could align all the windows instead he, he, he chooses to align some of the windows and then just uh pull some of them down make some surrounds but not all the way everything is sort of a both and uh, uh aspect of, of of this building also the peculiar combination of this sort of material richness and the the um you know perfect uh, choice of these uh peculiar colors um floors and walls and combinations um so there is, um, I think, uh, ending up on that um, amazing project, uh, which I think is almost um, too rich to, to um, you know, sum up. But I can highly um, recommend a visit the next time we come to Stockholm. Uh, and I think, of course, um, well, there are lots of things to see. Um, and. Uh, Yes, I think I will end the, the the tour there, so to say, and open up for some questions. Samuel, thank you so much. That was absolutely sensational. I feel comprehensively outnerded. Uh, <laughs> last project is is uh, quite quite a mind blower. Um, um, uh, yeah, we don't have so much time, to, but but please pitch your questions for Samuel um, in the chat box. And I do have a first one from Samantha. Schwang, who I'm going to unmute. Um, Samantha, you have the microphone. 
Okay, hello. Um, thank you for this amazing, amazing walkout. I think um, since I think presidents is such an, an important part of um, education, uh, architectural design, and I think there is something special about firsthand experience and the skill of learning from firsthand experience with architecture is like something that's like very, a very hard thing to learn. And I wonder from a logistic perspective and also from an abstract perspective, um, how do you execute the study of architecture firsthand? Like, do you do a more flanure manner and do spontaneous discoveries and then research afterwards? Or do you um, go in the library and dig materials and then do a more detailed pre-planning and where to go? Yes. And, yeah, that, that, that's a very interesting question, but uh, I think uh, it goes back a little bit to something I wanted to, to stress in the, in the first talk, perhaps most, which is a little bit like, well, for instance, uh, I, can, I can, if I'm being very practical, it's a bit like this sort of, a lot of this Stockholm, uh, because I live in Stockholm, a lot of the Stockholm's, uh, you know, um, examples are, are buildings that I, perhaps I'm, I'm I, I'm interested in one, I go there to see just that building, or I just, you know, go around in the city and I just come across some building um, that I, I, I stop and, and look more at. Whereas, let's say in, in, in Milan, for instance, that uh, we went there with our office on a study trip, so then I had planned out um, a way to see a lot, of, a lot of buildings in a short time, you might say. So, and of course then, how do you choose those buildings? Uh, well, I mean, I think in, in my case, in most people's case, I guess uh, you have some of your own, uh, you know, interests and so on, and and, and you search uh, and, lo and look at those. Uh, but I also think there is, um, by looking at them and, and reflecting on them, I do think that you're also sort of training your eye and uh, opening up for the possibility that you will simply come across some buildings that you relate to, or as you find intriguing and so on, and then, I think uh, a lot of these buildings are uh, that are have been shown now and also are on the this sort of Instagram feed are also buildings that are you know uh, discoveries and and then of course I, I think it's interesting to also do uh, at least a bit of research and knowing the year and architect and and such but um, I I find it most important in this project perhaps to um, to not make it too, uh, you know, um, deterministic in, in how the research is made and so on. So you keep it sort of open, uh, so you open it up to different readings. So I think a combination of the, of the two, the things you said, and I think uh, everyone should, you know, uh, work with um, the possibilities they have. If, if, if uh, looking at the local buildings is, I mean, that's a very rich field anywhere, I think, uh, and then also combining that, that with uh, special trips, perhaps. Um, next question, I think probably, uh, yeah, we've got Milena uh, Metalkova. Uh, Milena, you've yeah. got a uh, Thank you very much for this amazing trip. Um, especially at the beginning, when I was looking at uh, all those fantastic buildings, I was thinking about how you can define them and uh, something like proto postmodernist sensibility. Um, I wonder what Charles Jenks would call them. <laughs> yes. How you mean? do you see any relationship between postmodernism who developed much later? but maybe the postmodernism took over some of those uh, sensibilities? I think, uh, I mean, I think uh, as been said many times, I think we're all postmodernists in a sense. I mean, that is, uh, I mean, something that um, as a rediscovery of, of things and, you know, it put up a lot of discourse and then of course uh, things are moving on and there are, a much more, uh, let's say, diverse uh, discourse now. I think, for me, I, I think it's very much uh, is an, um, a dynamic of, of you know trying to 
find the things you find interesting and then and then searching in that direction and many times they sort of come together in different ways and they can have different you know uh, offshoots and so on so i don't I mean, there has been a lot of uh, discussion on the sort of stylistic uh, precedence and things like that, but I think it's mostly a kind of, a, it's a, it's one of the great joys of life, just, you know, taking, you know, either similar things or different things and, 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 and looking at them together. I, I think there is, a, I, don't, I don't categorize them in, in particular ways, but I mean, um, there might be some discussion there that is, of course, can be good to to know and so on. But I, I think it's mostly about coming close to, to buildings and, and seeing qualities in them and, 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 and then engaging in this kind of, you know, uh, culture exchange and discussion, I think, is also a very important part. I'm going to give the last question to James Payne. James, unmuting you. Hello, Samuel. Thanks for a wonderful lecture and thanks for the, the whole series. Uh, I, just reflecting on, on, the, um, on this lecture, it seems that there's a certain nostalgia in the, the 19th century city block in the examples that you show, whether it's national romantic or neoclassical and almost geological kind of mass, you know, that these buildings have. And it seems that this became much more difficult to achieve after the 20s or 30s. Um, whether that's because of society or whether because of building techniques, but and really only only could really only be simulated or reconstructed by some very particular situations and architects, perhaps Hans Koloff, perhaps um, Peter Salsing in the Bank of Sweden, maybe Peter Meckley, although he's he's never really done anything like a, a city block. Um, is it possible to to remake the nineteenth century city block? Um, I mean, there are, I think, th let's say, I mean, most of the times we find ourselves uh, nowadays are this kind of in-between diffuse uh, situations without any kind of context or, or <laughs> you know, qualities that we can relate to in many ways. And of course, uh, it's very rare to have something, you know, approaching that, that context. And if, if you take the context away, I, I think the, that all other all kind of city block becomes... Uh, I mean, it's sort of depending on that kind of context. I mean, I, I was actually thinking of, of, of uh, ending up uh, on the, um, you know, the uh, uh, very large uh, Peter Merkley building by, let's call it Imgut. It's a very long uh, block, white block, uh, with an exceptional um, courtyard um, colonnade. Uh, I mean, that there is something about that building that, I mean, it, it, it is a kind of a linear block in a sense, but, but I mean, it, it's almost so large that, that it has a kind of um, a quality of some of those blocks that are, you know, very big blocks, uh, urban situation like that. Um, so I don't know, there is something about the scale of some buildings, but of course nowadays, I, I think it's, um, I think it's very much, a, a, uh, a function of the different contexts we find ourselves in. I mean, the city block isn't is a kind of a rarefied. I mean, it's you can use it as a kind of nostalgic idea, of course, uh, anywhere almost uh, if you want. But um, it's very difficult uh, to find the conditions where it would be, um, you know, where it would sort of be natural. I mean, there there is an element of of, of uh, modern city planning where we are trying. People are trying to make city blocks and and. But they usually don't have that kind of uh, uh, charge or, or energy that the older uh, has because, of course, there are many times some kind of uh, lack of real urbanity in, the, in those uh, schemes uh, that, that they don't have the density, they don't have the sort of history or something like that. Um, so in a formal sense, uh, I don't think it's an uh, impossible you know, task, but uh, I think the conditions to are kind of rare um, to find nowadays.